friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we'll be seeing the in-depth analysis of union budget for the financial year 2019, which was presented yesterday. So for the beginners, union budget of every country, it aims to create a link between economic policy of the government on one hand to the economic welfare of the people of a country. So such an economic budget, it just doesn't deal with the revenues and the expenditures alone. But via the budget, the government makes in significant changes, thereby creating new educational opportunities, developing skills, creating more jobs, thereby maintaining the economic equilibrium of any country. Since this is an election year, we don't have a full-fledged union budget, but we have something called as interim budget. So this interim budget, unlike a full-fledged budget, it talks only about the expenditure side of the government and this budget is not presented for full 12 months but it is presented only for four months and in order to provide money for expenditure for the period of four months there is a vote on account using which the money is taken out of consolidated fund of India by the government to provide support to the, for these expenditure schemes. So in this video we will be seeing the various provisions introduced in the budget 2019. So let's begin with the basics of budget. So article 112 that is 112 of Indian constitution it talks about the budget. So the constitution refers to union budget as annual financial statement and this annual financial statement it provides a vision and also a signal for the policies which will be coming in the future that is the present financial year. So every budget it has three main components. So the first component it talks about the actual figures of previous year. And the second component, it talks about the budget and the revised estimates of the current fiscal year. And the third component, it talks about the budget estimates of the coming year. For example, we are currently in fiscal year 2018-19. So this budget, it talks about the budget estimates as well as the revised estimates for the ongoing year 2018 and 2019. And it also talks about the budget estimates about the expenditure for the upcoming year that is 2019 and 2020. And it presents the actual figures of the past year that is 2017 and 2018. So if you take in as a budget, the budget can be broadly classified into two. One is the revenue part and the second one is the expenditure part. So if you take the revenue part alone, so the receipts part basically consists of two components. One is the revenue component, the other is a capital component. So the revenue component is broadly classified into two, the tax side and the non-tax side. These are the various taxes which come under direct tax purview for the government and these are the indirect taxes which are also important source of tax revenue for the union government. The non-tax revenue component basically constitu is constituted by the interest payment and apart from that it also consists of other components like profits and dividend, grants and fees and fines. The capital receipts part it consists of components like this investment, recovery of loans, borrowing as well as provident funds. If you take the expenditure side of the budget, it is also similarly classified into two. One is the revenue side and the other is the capital side. The revenue side consists of the recurring payments made by the government, whereas the expenditure side it consists of, whereas the capital expenditure consists of the payment towards creating long time capital assets. So these are the basic components in a budget. All these components are taken from a specially created fund called as Consolidated Fund of India. And this Consolidated Fund of India is mentioned in Article 266 of Indian Constitution. Let's now see about this year interim budget that is the interim budget of 2019 and 2020. The main theme for this interim budget is realizing the potential of making India a new India by the year 2022. And the government plans to establish this via four main pillars. First one is by creating a clean and healthy India. This is established by providing universal access to toilets, water as well as electricity to every single citizen in our country. The government also plans to enhance the welfare of farmers by striving to double the farmers income by the year 2022. So the farmers who are the primary producers, they still constitute about 50% of Indian population. And increasing the income of the farmers will definitely increase the consumption of the Indian economy. 
So increase the consumption potential will drive the economic cycle of the country and thereby improving the health of Indian economy. Via budget, the government also aims to increase the opportunities for both youth and women to fulfill their dreams. And it also plans to establish India free from evil sources such as terrorism, communism, casteism, corruption as well as nepotism. So these are the actual key numbers presented in the budget. As I told before, this budget is for the estimated year 2019 and 2020. These are the budget estimates for the coming year. These numbers show the revised estimates for the current financial year. And these are the actual numbers for the financial year 2017 and 2018. This infographics, it shows both the receipts side as well as expenditure sides in figures for the current financial year. So as we see in the figure, the revenue side of the receipts has increased significantly. This can be attributed to the reforms brought in by the government like GST, which has brought more channels into formal economy, thereby increasing the figures. The capital side of the receipts has not increased significantly. However, there is a minute increase in the capital receipts as well. On the revenue side of the expenditure, there is significant increase in the revenue expenditure. This can be attributed to various factors like increased interest payments, increased grants to states, implementation of the 14th Finance Commission's devolution of taxes from 32% to 42% has significantly increased the devolution of funds to the states. Apart from this, salaries and pensions also contribute an important part of revenue expenditure. Implementation of 7th Pay Commission is attributable to this factor. On the capital expenditure side, there is no significant increase. This is a negative trend for Indian economy as only capital expenditure creates long-term assets, thereby acting as a significant driver for economic growth of our country. This side talks about the receipts and the expenditure of Indian government for the current financial year. So if you see UPSC in the prelims has a trend of asking the largest or the smallest components in either receipt side or the expenditure side. So knowing each and every component and its contribution to receipts and expenditure becomes important for the prelims exam. So if you come to the receipt side which actually talks about where the rupee comes from, there are two main contributors for it. First is a corporation tax, which is a direct tax which contributes to about 21% of the total receipts. And second is the GST, that is goods and the service tax, which is the indirect tax, which also contributes 21% of the total receipts for the center. Apart from this, borrowings and other liabilities from various sources contributes 19% of the total receipts. And income tax, which is a direct tax, contributes 17% of the total receipts. Other components include union excise duties, non-revenue tax, non-debt capital receipts, as well as customs duties. So since India is a welfare state, all these sources of income are significantly translated into contributing towards the welfareism of the citizens of a country. About 42% of the total expenditure is towards the welfare of Indian citizens. So this welfare side consists of sponsoring to centrally sponsored schemes, central sector schemes, subsidies, finance commission and other transfers to states as well as towards pensions. So apart from this, since government has borrowed from various sources, it has to repay the interest to the sources. So this interest payment, it contributes to about 18% of the total expenditure side. And 23% of the expenditure side goes to states share of taxes and duties, whereas defense occupies 8% of the total expenditure. This slide talks about the trends in the tax receipts of as a percentage to India's GDP. So as we can see, there is an increase in trend of gross tax receipts. The direct tax collection has more or less remained steady, but of late for past three years, there's an increasing trend in direct tax receipts also. The indirect tax collection has remained significantly low from 2011 to 2014. However, in the year 2018, it has raised the peak of about 6%. However, after 2018, it has remained stagnant in 5.5 percentage of GDP. The health of Indian economy can be assessed by using the concept of these four deficits. So we have to know what these four deficits are and also the trends of these deficits as percentage to GDP for our prelims exam. So first is the revenue deficit. 
So what is revenue deficit? Revenue deficit is basically the difference between revenue expenditure and the revenue receipts. So if you see the trend of revenue deficit in our country, it has been decreasing significantly thanks to the implementation of FRBM Act from the year 2003. The second deficit we'll be seeing is effective revenue deficit. So what is effective revenue deficit? So all the components of the revenue deficit which we saw now are not utilized for creating long-term capital assets. However, creating long-term capital assets is very much essential for the economic health. So if you exclude this long-term capital assets from the revenue deficit, then we create a deficit called as effective revenue deficit. The third indicator we'll be seeing is physical deficit. So physical deficit is a very important indicator of the other indicators. The physical deficit is basically the difference between the total expenditure minus the total receipts excluding the borrowings and other liabilities. So this basically talks about how much the center has to borrow in order to run various provisions for Indian economy. So if we see the trend of physical deficit, it has been decreasing significantly. However, for past three years, it has been stagnated at 3.4%. There is yet another deficit which is associated with physical deficit called as primary deficit. So this fourth component called as primary deficit is nothing but physical deficit minus interest paid by the government. So since the major component for the expenditure side is contributed by the interest payments by the government, if you exclude this from the physical deficit, we get the primary deficit. Primary deficit has been significantly reduced by the implementation of FRBM Act and it currently stands about, about only 2% of total GDP of India. So these are the key numbers in actual figures in crores of various components we saw before. So here the physical deficit is the largest contributor to the deficits. It stands at about 7 lakh crores. If you exclude the interest payment from it, this physical deficit is reduced significantly to primary deficit primary deficit which stands at about 38,000 crores. If you take the revenue deficit, it stands at about 4,70,000 crores and the effective revenue deficit which talks about asset creating revenue expenditure, it is about half of the revenue deficit and stands at about 2,60,000 crores. So now let's see about the subsidies part which is a component of revenue expenditure. So the government of India being a welfare state, it provides various subsidies to the citizens of the country. So the major subsidies include food subsidy, fertilizer subsidy and the petroleum subsidy. The food subsidy is a major subsidy provided by the government. So if you see the food subsidy, it has been increasing for the past three years. So if you come to the fertilizer subsidy, the farmers are the recipients of this subsidy. As government has shown considerable focus on doubling the farmers income by 2022, this fertilizer subsidy has also been increasing. The third is a petroleum subsidy. Petroleum subsidy is the smallest among the major three subsidies and this is also seen an increasing trend in the past three years. This slide talks about the various sources of deficit financing used by the government of India. The market borrowing stands first. In the past three years, the market borrowing has been the first largest source for deficit financing. It contributes to about 4,50,000 crores of total borrowing by the government of India. It is followed by Securities against small savings schemes. This is also, though this has reduced in the year 2018-19, it has now again increased for the budget estimates for 2019 and 20. So following this is the other receipts, that is internal debt and the public account for the financial year, for the budget estimates 19 and 20. The contribution from the state provident fund has remained static, whereas the external debt has gone, has seen a negative trend. The other major source of deficit financing is drawn from the cash balance. So until now, we saw the economics and the basics of the budget and the trends in Indian budget for past three years. So now let's see the new schemes and the provisions introduced in this budget for the coming financial year. The first scheme is for the welfare of the farmers. So going by the trends of states like Telangana, Orissa and Jharkhand, the government of India has introduced a new scheme called as PM Kisan, Pradhan Mandri Kisan Samman Nidhi, which provides income support to the farmers. So this is a direct benefit transfer scheme, which provides 6,000 rupees per annum for small and marginal farmers who have cultivable land less than 2 hectares only. The budget also talks about bringing in clean banking systems, thereby increasing the financial health of Indian economy. 
the finance minister also reinstated the importance of four r's which okay four r's that is recognition the solution recapitalization and the reforms this is especially important in order to curtail the non performing assets which is blooming in indian economy the government has also implemented insolvency and bankruptcy code in the year 2016 The government has also went for the bank recapitalization for the public sector banks in order to restore the physical health of the PSUs thereby providing sufficient capital buffer for the PSU banks. In order to curtail the menace of corruption, the government has implemented three important schemes. One is to stop the corruption in real estate area and to bring transparency into the real estate transactions. The government has implemented Real Estate Regulation and Development Act. It has also brought in significant amendments to Binami Transaction Act of 1988 in order to prevent corruption. In order to bring back the fugitive economic offenders who have fled the country, the government has implemented Fugitive Economic Offenders Act in 2019, which paves ways to confiscate as well as dispose the assets of the economic offenders in India. The budget has also massively scaled up the contribution to the healthcare system as good healthcare system is a basic necessity for developing human capital. Last year the government has rolled out Aishman Bharat which is termed as world's largest healthcare program providing health insurance to about to 10 crore family. The beneficiaries who are chosen based on socio-economic caste census will be provided affordable medicines to via Pradhan Mantri Jan Aayush Kendras developed especially in all the districts of the country. The budget 2019 also strives to bring in inclusiveness by bringing in new connectivity projects to northeastern India thus making it closer to mainland India. States like Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Mizoram are offered special connectivity projects. This is we are establishing multimodal connectivity which includes air, inland waterways as well as railway projects. The budget also reaches out to most deprived sections of Indian population. So, in the lines of Renke and Idate Committee, who has done significant work to identify denotified nomadic and semi-nomadic communities in our country, there is a specially set up committee under the ambit of Niti Aayog, which will complete the tasks initiated by these two committees. So, this Niti Aayog committee will identify the denotified nomadic and semi-nomadic communities who are not formally classified until today. and welfare development board under ministry of social justice and empowerment will set up special welfare schemes for the newly identified welfare communities so the government also strives to establish gender equality various schemes has been employed for women's development as well as women's empowerment so so far almost 6 crore free lpg connections has been given under ujwala scheme for indian rural women and almost 70% of the total beneficiaries under mudra scheme for the msme sector has been for women the government has also increased the maternity leave for 26 weeks the various provisions under pradhan mantri matri vandana yojana strives to improve the health of indian women the government also focuses towards the unorganized sector and aims to bring in under social security ambit It has rolled out Pradhan Mantri Shram Yogi Mandan, which provides assured monthly pension of about three thousand rupees for the aged people of about sixty years every year. This budget, apart from agriculture, it also focuses on the livestock sector. Apart from already existing Rashtriya Gokul Yojana, the budget also sets up a new scheme called as Rashtriya Kamadenu Aayog. It aims to sustainably upgrade the genetic resources of the cows, thereby enhancing the production as well as productivity of the cows. So, with the increasing trend for the organic food products, significant development of uh, livestock sector becomes crucial as livestock sector is a major contributor for the pesticides for organic farming. So, apart from this, the budget also helps the farmers. with the negative effects of climate change becoming increasingly evident the farmers are the most important community by severe natural calamities so in order to support the farmers the budget proposes to provide interest subvention of 2% and prompt repayment incentive of 3% for the entire period of reschedulement of the loans due to calamities which is provided under national disaster relief fund So apart from this this budget also proposes for a clear vision for the next decade. So this vision it strives to establish a 5 trillion dollar Indian economy in next 5 years and 10 trillion dollar Indian economy in the next 8 years thereafter. 
So in order to achieve this 10 trillion dollar Indian economy, it provides 10 thematic drivers. The first driver is establishing infrastructural facilities, both physical as well as social. Second driver is to build a potent digital India. This becomes very much important in the context of industrial revolution 4.0s and new technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing. The third driver is establishing clean and green India by using renewable by using renewable sources of energy as well as electric vehicles to bring down pollution. The fourth area is expanding rural industrialization using modern technologies thereby bringing in urban amenities in rural areas. The fifth driver is to provide clean rivers and also clean sources of drinking water to all the citizens of India. Six driver talks about using offshore sources for power development like using coastline and ocean waters. Seventh driver talks about the scientific development in space technology, especially in the area of spending manned space mission by the year 2020. Eighth driver is about bringing in self-sufficiency in food. And ninth one talks about bringing, creating a healthy India which is distress free by using a comprehensive wellness system for all the citizens. So all these drivers will be established by using minimum government and maximum governance to create a new India by the year 2020. These 10 drivers contribute to development of new vision of India by 2030.